like a, a Saturday night to go live to talk about soil DNA and compost DNA. So uh, thank you for, for tuning in possibly later. <laughs> if so, now that would be awesome as well. Hold on one second. I just wanna close that door. All right, so the reason I began looking at soil DNA was because all of the journals and published works I read were specific about specific microbes and about specific reactions. And what my mentors were teaching me was fungal to bacterial ratios and a very generalized way of looking at things. And so, and then I realized, what I realized basically was composting had a lot of faith built in around it. And so I, I this device, this device is incredible. This is an Oxford nanopore DNA sequencer, a minion. And this is different from the classical genetic testing. And now we could get to call it classical. <laughs> Here, I'm gonna keep putting it on, um, on ice but not too much ice. I gotta keep it <laughs> teetering and tottering. But but I got into this because of William Padilla Brown. So William is, is all about genetic testing. He, it's because he has been able to learn so much more about cordyceps, also mushrooms in general. Um, and he's also just really into it. He's, he's uh, got this endless curiosity and he and I, like, we send each other. I mean, I'm sure to other people that they, they might not even understand where, what we're talking about. Because we, like, talk about, like, we're, like, always have a constant, like, thread. And I'm like, have you seen this article? Duh, 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 duh. This means this, right? And, and, like, we're, like, constantly going back and forth. And so William Padilla Brown is my favorite people in the world. And um, <clears throat> he is a, if you don't know him, he's my uh, citizen scientist, mycology guy, and he has, uh, he, he's gotten me to go down this rabbit hole with him. And he actually came down and helped me do my first run, uh, helped me get set up with the DNA. So, so this is the Minion. I have the box, you know, JHS watchers, you know what I mean. Um, I've got all the goods, you know, all the little pamphlets, you know. <laughs> Don't get rid of any of these things if you get this. Um, because it all is important. So this, this device is really incredible. Um, the reason I went with this device, not only is it more affordable than any other option, uh, and it, it's more accurate for a variety of reasons that we'll get into, but I'm just going to open it right here. Um, and you can see that there's this, this white module in here. This is uh, a test cell. I don't know if you can see that yet. Yeah, it's, it's a test cell. And so this, this is a sequencer that can attach to your computer. There's an image of it right here, um, up, uh, up close. And this piece that is not a test, you know, flow cell, but an actual one. You know, I wonder about this. I know there's, okay, we'll talk about it later. So anyway, this is an expired one, but if you look here, this is, maybe if it, it wants to focus like this. Will it get, let me get really close and focus? No, all right. So, all right, so this is, this is um, a spot on port right here, and this is where you drip your actual isolated and prepared DNA. We'll get into all that because there's a lot there. It's a, that's like a big statement because <laughs> you're going to prepare it a variety of ways. And it's really like an isolation of an isolation of an isolation of an isolation, you know, kind of thing. And so just like with soil testing, all of all sorts, it's this tiny subsection of reality that we're taking and blowing up and looking at, but we have to remember we're looking at a galaxy. A um, 
and 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 yes, <laughs> I I don't mean to like say that the the. That, that there's not efficacy in testing, um, but there's limitations and caveats as well. So, so all right, so this, this is the flow cell. This is the actual, if you can see that, yeah, you can. Um, this is where the, where it actually connects to this device. And when you, when you load it with the DNA, you have this other, this other fluid that acts as like a, like a, a carrier substrate. It's really like the oil of the machine in a way, but much more complicated than that because this is uh, electric and it's like bioelectric, right? And so uh, that passes through here and this, this long tail here is the waste. So it's a flow cell. So you're constantly flowing through with liquid and it passes the the tagged and they put guides on well we put i put um guides on on top and i've done this with dozens of samples already on on top of the dna strand that guide it through nanopores right here and these nanopores have little sensors that read um, the DNA strand as it passes through the pore and each A, G, C, T, you know, uh, the genetic code, it, it just reads it off like a, like a, a barcode. Um, so it's, it's, it's an incredible new technology and it's nanopore. So it's one to one. It's not PCR. So why wouldn't I do PCR? I mean, I thought PCR was the best, Matt. What are you talking about? Matt PCR is the best. Uh, no, no, it's actually not. Um, it's not. It's a cool idea. Um, I like delay pedals. You like delay pedals? I like guitars. So a delay pedal, the way it works is you put it on and then you got the cycles and the feedback. And so it's just like the PCR where you're amplifying a signal. And so you put it on, you go shun, 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 right? Like low cycle, right? You've increased the, 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 the sustain. And so with PCR polymerase chain um, uh, reaction, what we're doing is we are, 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 are splitting the DNA half and then we're combining it um, with, this, with this, this substrate and we're actually causing mutations and all these other things, but it's replicating it. So it's, you can find it easier but that's why you don't do it with soil. Because if you're in a band and everyone puts every instrument on a different like delay pedal um, and it's all like -na 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 -na, like high cycles, like they did with PCR with certain, certain kinds of tests in America. Um, the reason they moved away from that was because they did it at such high cycles they could create anything. I know people who've done isolates of fungi and they know it's just fungi and it read as bacteria because they chopped it up too much with the PCR. So when you do a whole band, it makes this cacophony. When you do it with soil or blood, it creates cacophony with PCR. So they need to be able to uh, like wade into complexity and do a one-to-one, -one, which is what this does. It's not... It, it's not without its drawbacks. Um, because of the cacophony, certain things are louder than other. Cacophony is like a chaos of sound. Thank you, Eli, for asking. Um, I was an English teacher and I studied uh, Shakespeare and, <laughs> and James Joyce in, in college. So I got all sorts of problems. Um, no, but like my, I, I, I range all over the map. Um, so, but, but, but the, the, this is a really precise way of actually getting around the problem of PCR and getting around the problem of microscopy with the bacteria. Because if you were going to take like any kind of microscope course um, and you started looking at the literature around, you'd find out certain things um, are well known. And one of those things that, that is well known is like, you can only do a certain amount of things with bacteria with this. This only goes up to a thousand resolutions. So all those microscopes 
out there that say they're going to 2000 resolution are just magic, magic unicorns. No, you actually can't. Like if you're like in film and microscopy, you know that like this, like you can't, in my bright field microscopy cannot go past a thousand X resolution. Um, that's just the limit of actual visual, like that's, that's the, that you go back to physics, you know? But the point is, is that you actually can't characterize, characterize um, beyond uh, the morphological differences in bacteria with that, with bright field. And you can do stains, you can do gram positive, gram negative, but everyone in, is working with isolates and isolated samples. And so you have to start pairing these two things, the DNA testing and the microscopy to actually get a clear picture. Because you see the amounts over here very clearly you can count things very easily. You can characterize things very easily and, and you can monitor the behavior with the microscope, especially with the epifluorescence module in the microscope. But with the DNA testing, we can do a lot more and it's different. So you're like, all right, okay, I get what you got. That's cool, but what's, what's the use? Let's, let's go look um, because I tested, I tested two forms of EM and can you DNA, uh, I, I, this as you'll see is basically mostly bacteria. I need to get this, this type of salt that is supply chain back ordered in America. And I like, I tried to get it from Germany and they were like, no citizen scientists are allowed to have salt. And I'm like, Really? Huh. That seems strange. <laughs> and so I'm going to get this salt in August and I'll be able to do the bead, the magnetic bead chain cleanup. That'll make it so that we can see the fungi. Hopefully I'm talking with their team. Um, I've been talking with their team for months. Um, but like the, Fung there's a reason why the mycology community is isolating the fungi, doing the plates and the Petri dishes and isolating it and then PCRing it because they know they got it isolated. They know it's from a culture or from a, a sampling that they've separated out. And now they're, they're PCR, so they're amplifying it. So it's like ideally just that guitar, right? <laughs> And just that guitar take, you know, cause you could have like a whole like family of Ascomycota like crowded into an area or something like that or, but, but my, 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 my point is, is that I'm, I'm going to find out more in August, but, but I want like people to know like how, like what's easy, what's not, what tests are like limited in what ways. And so that's why I'm talking about it. And there's also crazy things that I'm about to show you. And that's also why I have to come on here and show you guys things. <laughs> Cause it's crazy. Um, so let's just look at this for a second. Um, I think we can like zoom in here. You guys can see this, right? Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, so uh, hardly any archaea, hardly any viruses. The viruses that are there are mu viruses. Those are bacterial viruses that are actually one of the ways that horizontal gene transfer happens. So the, the this virus isn't for us. This virus is for bacteria. It's a very tiny virus and it transfers genes between bacteria. And all right, there you go. Come on, computer. <laughs> so, so it's mostly bacteria that's been read, but there's all this unclassified DNA. And I know a chunk of it is fungi, but I also know we probably broken up some stuff that uh, a, a little bit too much and it looks like bacteria. Wrap your mind around that for a second with me. When you break things up, 
that are fungi, you chop up their back, their, their, their DNA, it looks like bacteria. Crazy. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Might be a clue as to like evolution. I don't know, but something I've noticed, right? Eli liked it. Thank you, Eli. So the eukaryota here is primarily human DNA. And that could be contamination. Or I'm hearing from everyone, though, that I talk to behind the scenes that there's human DNA in every sample and everything. And that is going to tie into something I'm going to tell you in a minute. So, so you guys know that there's uh, mobile genetic elements, right? MBEs. And so we all have these mobile genetic elements that are passing into us and out of us at all times. And there are fragments of DNA all over everything. And that's what like the unclassified DNA is. So like it's fragments of DNA and pieces of, of, of DNA because DNA breaks down, not like instant poof, you know, like chunks up, just like when we break it down with all these, these like different, like, uh, I mean, there's stages and different things we do. So, I mean, it's, it goes, it's like a whole day. <laughs> uh, um, but, but, but it, 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 the environment, it takes weeks, if not years for DNA to break down. And there's life constantly growing and feeding and, and all around it and eating it and absorbing it and using it as like a, a random grab bag or as a specific grab bag for specific environments and times. All right, let's get into it. So uh, who is the bacteria here? Who's the majority of the bacteria here? Let's just scroll down. Oh, and by the way, reads classified. You guys see that, right? Reads analyzed. All the other studies that I ever saw had 10 times less reads because they weren't willing to burn through their <laughs> their flow cell because it costs a fortune. But I had to know what happens when you let these things go and like and like actually do the sequencing because it's like, if it's actually soil or compost, it's gonna be complicated. I mean, they always talk about how there's millions of bacteria in, is there? Is there really? Well, that's the thing is it's like, I wanna do a five day read next. Um, I don't go through a full, full flow cell. I didn't go through a full full cell for this, but I almost did. Um, I was, I was just seeing how it would go. Oh, did you see that? Oh, did you look? Did you saw? Right? <laughs> so I was like, wait, what? Huh? No. What did I do wrong? I mean, we can go to the other sessions if you want and see, but the reality is you can see that I had this barcoded out to sample. So, um, these are divergently different samples. And the reality is I can exclude and include each one of these, but the reality is you're gonna see the same actors and the same dominance. And that's because E. coli is not who we thought it was. So if you're like, well, and, 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 and there are people that say, oh, you can use that thing, this wonderful thing, I love this thing, but the microscope to see E. coli, because they're usually spiro key. What? Let's Google Scholar that. Because, I mean, it, I mean, they're, they're, they're that like rounded rectangular rod bacilli shape. And 
they'll just look like everyone else. And this is, this is, these are all like scholarly reports and please go and do this yourself. And you'll see that it's not a spiral. And if you've been trained to look for just spirochetes and, and corkscrew, corkscrew shapes for E. coli, that's not good. Okay, so, so, so let's delve more into E. coli. Um, did you know, let's just make this man bigger. Do you know this guy? So this guy talks about synthetic biology and E. coli. And when I listened to this, it totally changed the way I view E. coli. E. coli is like an ultimate chassis. You can watch this video on, on YouTube. It blew my mind. And I'm not a GMO guy, not, not pro GMO. I'm actually anti GMO. I'm pro like natural heirloom and all that. But I read everything. I read everything. And so everything I can, I mean, someone asked me today about a book I had read and I was like, I want to read it, but, but, and, and I, and I watch things that are awesome and, and, and people that are fascinating. And the thing is the GMO community is using E. coli because it's the ultimate universal chassis. The word E. coli, um, or the, you know, full name, Escherichia coli, um, is like the word mammal. There are millions of species of E. coli. So because there's millions of species of E. coli and there's like what? seven to nine pathogenic ones that we know of. That's pretty like proportionately like <laughs> significant. And so you have E. coli that's commensual in all plants. It's an endophyte that's universal, like found everywhere. And it's primary in decomposition as we just talked about. Like it's 50% to like, like 80% of like samples. Um, and it's 40 to 50% of the best compost that like everybody's raving about and it's the certified and has everything. That compost also has 40% of it is E. coli, but it's the good E. coli. And so like, what do I mean by that? So because it's an endophyte, it goes inside the plant because it's primary to decomposition. It's all over everything. And it's the feedback loop. The reason it's in all of our digestions is it's in all the plants to begin with. It's where it all began. I mean, it had to be somewhere, right? And it was in the soil and in the plants and in all decomposition. The thing is, the pathogenicity of like O one five seven zero, right? That E. coli strain may be environmental. Like they're actually picking up those pieces of the of those elements that are genetic fragments in the environment in the anaerobic, you know, environment when it's when there's no oxygen and you know pathogens and disease causing uh, things thrive. Maybe they're picking it up from the actual environment. Or we may also have a situation, and this could also be at the same time the same thing happening. We may be priming these things and training them. And that's why it's extra important that we test. Um, let's talk more about this. Boom. So, uh, biofertilizer microorganisms accompanying pathogenic attributes and potential threat. People are recognizing that things that can help plants can also, if in too large amounts, can hurt the plant. Or there are certain things that plants use as defensive mechanisms from predation. If we're eating the plant, we're the predators in this situation. So like aluminum. Like if you're doing um, the bioceramic EM treatments, um, that's alumina. 
and it's amphoteric, so it rips the, 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 the nutrients, you know, the, the cations off of um, organic compounds and manure and kelp and stuff and makes them soluble um, ions that when you add it into the, 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 the root environment, they just get absorbed. Um, and that's cool, but if it's too much aluminum that's going into there and you're in the wrong pH range and your plants are now taking up aluminum, there's like a threshold where they're like defensive against plants being like eaten by predators because of the aluminum in them. And it's the plants are fine. And so like that was the well played by the plant in that situation, but terrible for us. So we have to like be again aware and testing. So, right, potential threats. Ah, hold on. Utilization of microbial consortia as biofertilizers and biopesticides for production of feasible agricultural products. Um, I I could search for it. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, so this is the thing. All plant growth promoting um, rhizobacteria release certain phytohormones or phosphate solubilizers. This is an incredible, an incredible diagram, actually. Let's make that big. These guys rock. I don't know who this is. I'm going to figure it out, though. So, no, we don't want this thing in the side. There we go. So, cyberphores, so iron, antibiotics, phytoremediation, phosphate solubilizer, phytohormones, nitrogen fixers, IA, IAA, you know, that's, that's indole uh, acetic acid. Um, that, that's released by E. coli. And if you can persist inside of a plant, then you must be a nitrogen fixer. So, so that's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. So when we check that out, we realize that E. coli produced that and they actually can fix nitrogen and they're realizing now unexpectedly, this is a, um, <laughs> what year is this? Um, 2019, yeah. So they're just figuring this out. <laughs> Um, right now. And so I have people sending me papers about how they're talking about how it's fundamental to rhizophagy in plant roots and uh, fu fundamental to all plants. And so I have, pe uh, I have people sending me those kinds of papers right now about all this. And then after they told me that, I went online and like did this whole run around search like we're doing together here. And it's like, like Enterobacter is a type of E. coli is an endophyte that establishes, nu establishes nutrient transfer symbiosis with plant, with banana plants and protects against the black Sigatoka pathogen. So because it releases IAA, indole acetic acid, it actually primes the plant and it causes it to, to go on immunological um, alert. And, and so it then can block against definitely more pathogens than that be, because of what it actually did to the plant, changed the plant's actual behavior. So this is, this is like what's been going on. And then you can read about endolacetic acid. Um, it's the most commonly naturally occurring plant hormone of the auxin class. So, so just going back to here though, if it'll let me. Uh, we see streptomycetes, right? That's, that's number two, if we discount um, the, the, the homo sapien, um, which is just about, it's like 4% of all of them. Um, so it, it's rather low, but that's the whole point, is it's basically all E. coli. And when we think about the fact that E. coli is in our guts and our digestion, in the soil, all part of decomposition, and then in the plants as a biofertilizer and we're eating it, it's part of our feedback loop with the natural world. 
And that's why it's so incredibly important that we keep this pristine because the bad pathogenic fungi goes inside the plants too. It, it establishes inside the plants too. And so, and potentially like if we do trichoderma and then we do our brusculum mycorrhizal fungi to create a filter and block that out from like the spinach and the other things that are, that are uptaking it, I don't know. They may welcome it in. Um, and we also may be able to do environmental things that trigger the reversal or the undoing of the pathogenicity of that E. coli. So that they actually revert and become beneficial again. Because we've seen this with um, Fusarium. We saw it retasked in, in, into a bio, by a biofertilizer, an endophyte that was inside a plant retasked Fusarium to do other beneficial things inside the plant, the tomato plant in this case, than hurting it. So we need to not just use this type of technology and this type of technology because this is how we tell the fungi right now, reliably. Um, I know that there are people doing fungi with DNA in soil samples. I'm really curious as to what they're doing and what kind of controls they put on themselves. Like what kind of like, like caveats, because the soil reports come back as so authoritative. They're like, this is the thing you do. Hmm. And it's, it's not that way at all. That's why I'm going to be developing something that marries these two worlds. Because it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's more complicated. Ready? You ready? Okay, here we go. Um, dun, 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 dun. Number two, start with my seeds. We we have we have an issue with this because this is where like penicillin and the majority of all the antibiotics in the world come from. So because that's where antibiotics come from, if you want to hang out here in the compost, you have to be resistant to anti bacterial compounds. So in other words, we're training the compost to have antibiotic resistant genes. Mm. And side note, if you don't get your compost hot enough and keep it hot, you can train the Shigella and the and the uh, pathogenic E. coli and the salmonella to hang out. So we're, 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 we're training them to stay if we don't get a hot burn on there. So we need to like select for the right things. And then we also like need to do more testing and then, um, like, like you can see aspergillus, like the dangerous aspergillus with this, which is awesome. Like that's what, like one of the things that is just awesome because I feel like you, you, because of the way it isolates things, you might miss certain things that are in the environment. Like the way that things behave, you can see with this. I can do a live dead stain that tells me who's alive and who's dead with like four drops of the stain, um, and this protocol I, I, I came up with um, that, that actually, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be so exciting when I reveal and I will reveal it live soon. Um, but, but my point is though that you can you can only do certain things with this. You can only do certain things with this, but it doesn't end there. When was the last time you talked to someone about their compost and their nitrate levels in their compost? Like, like the backyard person, are they like, actually shake testing the nitrogen levels on that compost. What about the phosphorus? Remember phosphorus inhibits mycelium, inhibits mycorrhizal action, right? And growth. So like knowing the NPK of our compost, you know, is vital. So like, all right, all right, you're with me. So like, what about it? We keep adding in dis points of distinction. So you're like, okay, well, what if like, 
not just the NPK, the biological microscope assessment, the DNA assessment. We do a mineral, the classic mineral thing on top of that, like, 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 like all the micro minerals and all that. Then you can do the salinity conductivity test, the EC. Then you can do the ORP, the oxidation reduction um, or redox meter because you can put it in solution because you can literally take the soil with like 50% soil, 50% water. There's protocols around this, okay? And, and you can tell the redox because it's correlative. I know you're adding water in and that like changes it, no doubt, but it's, you can actually create a correlative um, um, to, to a comparative. And, and, and you can add that as a point of distinction and there are more. And so I am working on a new database that's going to be transparent that will allow for all of us to see, A, like what people are seeing, like what nematodes look like what, and you know what I mean? But, and like, like everyone to be able to actually see like all the different soil food web members and identification and actual full library. That's awesome, videos and pictures, amazing, right? but the DNA for those samples as well. And the millivolts, the actual millivolts of that sample. And then when you flip over the, you know, <laughs> you know, the whole thing, and you can look at the other end and start connecting these things across bioregions, across pHs, then you're like, oh, wow. Do you see a long pH seven? How the clay, when the clay content varies, so does the ratio of streptomyces to E. coli. Now, that was an example that, you know, I'm just, you know, spitballing, right, right? But, but that's the kind of thing we're going to like see, like boom. And, 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 and this is how people arrived at the conclusion that like pH is directly related to, to moisture. And of course it is, it's power of hydrogen, right? But they're like, of course it is, right? Well, I want to see it. Let's get the soil samples. And then they took the soil samples and pH tested them and showed that, yes, moisture in the soil relates directly to pH on a bioregional level. And so humidity across bioregions pairs directly with pH. But if we had a citizen science database that showed that, that actually you could click and then actually see not just that, but like, like, like manipulate it, you know, and actually be like, well, well, what would happen um, if you just isolate it along this parameter? And it's like, that's the kind of questioning and thinking that we need to go to the next level. The reality is we can't do the pyramid thing with the guru on top and get any further than we are, we are at because the problem is, the guru at the top is always incentivized to um, control the information. And so uh, we, we, we give them all this power and they hold back progress. And I hate that. <laughs> because they're holding back all of us, A, from being like the heroes of our own story, but B, like, this is the linchpin for all of our food, health, future, like everything. All of our children's health, their children's children. If we can properly unlock these things and these connections and these deeper understandings to create new methods, new caveats, limitations, new testing, like, like th this is why I'm gonna be doing this. I'm gonna be doing a Kickstarter around this eventually um, in the next, like, I don't know. I don't know how fast I'll be able to put it together, but but I, 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 I have a test series of uh, over 40 points of distinction that um, create a holistic picture of what a soil is or a compost sample is. And through that lens, we're going to be able to actually examine these things and and compare them across all like like bio region you know what i mean compare to each other and cross reference across each other and look for those patterns 
um, and, 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 and then turn them into like literal like maps and charts and, and all these, these, these things that make it so it's more understandable and real. And so the only way that we can do this in a way that I see that will actually make it go fast enough because there's so much shenanigans going on. Like you just saw the E. coli thing, right? Like, come on. Like E. coli is like the big baddie and, and it's like all over everything. It's a, it's a plant endophyte and inside all every plant, really? It's the, it's the primary decomposer and like we just think of it as like manure, you know what I mean? And it's, it's a complicated world. And so we, we, but it's like beautiful in the complexity, right? There, there's, there's, there's so much there. And the thing is, it's like, if we don't go into the space with like transparency and openness and show all the results in a way that is like involves the public in them testing too, and showing like how we can democratize and cre democratize and create community labs around this, we're not going to get straight answers because we haven't gotten straight answers. So we can't think that we're going to get straight answers because like, right, like the definition of insanity is doing the same old thing, expecting a different, a different result, right? So William Padilla Brown is such a great example of citizen, citizen science of, of pushing the envelope. So he got me to, you know, take the dive and I've been evaluating this and this is, this is more accurate than, 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 than all those other methods that we talked about. This tells you who's actually in there and yes, Ooh, there, 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 there's more, there's more to navigate here, but so is there with this. There's limits, huge limitations on this. You can't, I mean, you can, you, you, you can't like know like the fungi like perfectly. You can, some of it, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious some of it. But some of it is very difficult to tell when it's sporulating, it's coming out. Many people mistake things for oomycytes that aren't. And then it's like, okay, that's a wood saprophyte. Good stuff, good, great. Which one? 70% of them are endophytes and the rest are not. I want the 17%. So differentiation and selection is the future. We, I mean, like that, that's, that's the reality is it's like people are going to create tailored composts that actually, um, like they're going to like, like, you know how we're buying biofertilizers that are like mycorrhizal inoculants and they've got like four different things and they're, they're all like glomus this, glomus that, or, or, or rhizophagus if you're, <laughs> depends on, <laughs> we don't have to get into it now. But, but the point is that you have this whole little selection you got going. The future is us, like, like, and then EM is the same thing. EM's like essence of compost, okay? Like, you'll find what's in EM in a compost heap. That's really good. Especially if it's near the ocean is, or large bodies of water is what I've found. Purple non-sulfur bacteria, Rhodocytomonas palustris, the crazy, amazing feeds four different ways microbe is either in complex plants already like um like spirulina or like or it's in the air so we're going to dna test the air at, at some point soon but i want to get that salt so there's no <laughs> every single one of these tests is like a, a money bath like it's crazy so i, I don't want to waste anything I don't want to waste any of the resources we literally do everything in drops and fractions of a drop I, I got it out the first time and I was like, William, I think I lost everything. There's, there's a drop only in here. And he's like, that's okay. That drop will last many, many times. And I'm like, okay. Is this like a faith, faith thing or something? And he's like, and, he's, and then I get the, the actual micro pipette and it, and it goes 
to fractions of a drop. It's absolutely incredible. And you also have to hold very, very, very still. Um, when you're doing this, especially. Very, very, very still. Um, so I am doing the soil DNA testing because I was learning everything I could from university, from, uh, I did an intensive uh, that Dr. Elaine Ingham did. Um, and I learned from her graduates, like Chris Trump and Catherine Hinson, Brian Vag. Um, and, and then I read everything I could that's published and book for everything I could that's published in, um, in, in, in peer reviewed journals. And I started realizing that there's like a huge amount of, of, of just limitation and, and it just doesn't tell you what I think it does. Um, a lot of the time. And so you have to be really careful with, with your assumptions. Um, and those caveats, we, some of those, like, like the umicite differentiation, like the water mold umicite, right? Differentiation from um, saprophytic fungi coming out of a spore. Like those kinds of differentiations are really key. Um, but it's much more than that when you get into like um, the fact that you can't tell good E. coli from bad E. coli. So you could have a mother compost, which is increasingly common and you could have bad pathogens crawl into it. And then if we just go down here, um, you notice that salmonella is in there. Right, that's not good. But then you also notice Brady rhizobium, Pseudomonas of all sorts, Burkholderia, Mesorhizobium. Um, yeah. It's, um, it's, and then you might be like, oh, Matt, you're, you're, you you need to do, you need to test more things. And I am, and I, and that's why I want to change up the, and, and, and go to the highest level. And it's, it's more tedious and obviously the, the salt special, the salt I can't buy. <laughs> But, but no, I, I mean, it's not even that much money, um, for the salt. Um, but, um, it's, it's, it's just really, really incredible to like, see like the difference between like EM1 and a scaled up version of it that's been extended and scaled for 20 years. So that's what these two, uh, not this guy. Um, this guy. So these two, notice that like, they're pretty darn close in, um, in numbers, but one is going to be dominant E. coli. And that's the, that's the one that was, that's 20 years old. And one with less reads is balanced, well, it's leading just by a hair with the lactobacillus, so the lab. So, and then this is the one um, from the actual, um, I just restarted, let me just exclude it all again. It does that routinely, it refreshes. Huh. Folks are home. All right, so the point in all this is, is that things can crawl into our biofertilizers, our mixes. We need to have systems that create pure cultures and that detect, using this and other things, that detect uh, pathogens so that we can um, quickly respond, we can, um, there are there are things that people can do, right? You can kill bacteria, um, but 
but that but but we need to create new protocols and if we can horizontal gene transfer those e coli that are pathogenic and overpower them like if we have like uh like a good microbial bath that we just uh turn the pile like oh this pile has gone uh gotten a contaminant in it maybe it was a bird that brought it in we don't know well we're going to turn it with this special compost tea this special microbial brew and it's going to eat or horizontal gene transfer right so so that is conjugation so they're having sex um so like 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 that that's like happening and then there's viruses and and in Increasingly, people are wanting to use viruses as transmission, like um, vectors for, for vaccines and stuff, um, which seems crazy. It's like we're trying to stop virus. We want to use a virus to spread a vaccine. It's like, wait a second. Um, but 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 it's also another vector for horizontal gene transfer. So they this this could be the next thing that the genetic modification people get into. And then the third thing is through the dead. DNA that's everywhere. The fragments of dead DNA everywhere that can be eaten and consumed and absorbed. This is how fungi, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi can just like absorb nuclei of random things and then put out things that represent multiple nucleic information, right? How, how do they do? They're doing it because that's just part of horizontal gene transfer. Everything is absorbing everything and constantly becoming in response to the outer signal. So like, this is how oomocytes came to be. Oomocytes are a combination of like, I like, well, actually, hold on, back that up. Actinobacteria is really a combination of oomocytes, like water molds and fungi. That's why they like took over their own niche and then pushed fungi out. And so it's like, they, they're like the false fungi, but like when you look at them, they're clear um, fungi looking type things. And they're, they're not as pretty, they're not as uniform, their walls are not the same. Um, coloration is usually what you use to distinguish them, uh, size, um, wall thing, all those kinds of things to, to distinguish them. But it's that actinobacteria that are this bridge between them and like the even more sporadic and crazy looking water molds, the oomocytes. And they're actually genetically like a combination of the two. And that makes sense. I mean, if you're constantly absorbing genetic information all the time and you're trying to occupy niches that you would like, you, you know what I mean? You'd be a combination of, of the things that are there um, in, you know what I mean? You, you couldn't help it. You know, it's, it's, in, it's in the field. So, so it's incredibly in, important to, to go into this space, I believe, and to figure out, yeah, an admixture of both, to figure out where these things start and end, the limitations of things, and then to stack it all with everything that we can a mass information wise. And then when we do that in a database, and when I talk about this database, we'll have a membership side that like supports it and everything and they, they can download the actual DNA files and then rerun them through their own systems or other databases and such. But most people aren't gonna want 90 to 120 pages of AGCT, blah, 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 blah like shh. So, they're gonna want like, like this. They're gonna want like this. They're gonna want a simple breakdown. They want red flags. They want the main ratios. And I'm convinced that if we put enough effort into this and enough input into this, we're gonna see that the ratios of the rhizobias, and fascinating that rhizobia makes it through compost, right? I never thought that. Huge surprise. And I've never heard of anyone talking about how compost has the inoculants for all the legumes already in it. Like, whoa. So, 
So uh, the rhizobia, streptomycetes, E. coli, Burkholderia, um, and, and others. Um, yeasts, um, beer yeast. These, these players, their ratios, I believe, just are like flipped around. And so I think that pH, soil type, and then plant type goals and like that whole system actually will map out to ratios related to like 10 different main microbe classes. And then from there, there's all these key trigger um, uh, for immunological responses like we talked about and then um, uh, feeding internally and then feeding in the roots and nutrient unlocks and, and solubilizing. Like there's this whole suite of, of micro, it's in my book, Regenerative Soil, if you wanna look at that. Um, that's, that's one of like the ciphers that you would use to like, like do all this kind of stuff. Um, but, but being able to map that, we're going to, I really think that we're gonna see not just like, you know, uh, rhizophagus like deserticola or glomus deserticola. It's like, oh, it's great, you know, in arid climates. It's like, we're going to have so much more sophisticated information. But that only comes through it being transparent. So all those like data points that I talked about, I want to make public. So this database that I'm talking about already... I have the pieces, I have the website, I have the plan. I'm talking to uh, website designers and, and I, I really wanna make it researchable. I wanna make like the, the I wanna make, it, make the membership really attractive too. So we get people to support it so we can make it really nice. Um, and I also want it rated so that you give like, like one out of four stars on each test series that you see. So what'll happen is you'll, you know, you, you're, you're putting in all of the, your, your searches and all your different things and you're making it better and better. And, and as you get better, people are rating it. And so it's rising up in the search engine. And so anyway, and it also lets people when they go and re, like are actually trying to learn, they see your star rating and they're like, oh wow, this is a trustworthy person to learn from. And that's completely crowdsourced. I want to. I want to give as much autonomy and empowerment to citizen science community as much as possible, because it's only through facilitating that that we're going to actually move fast enough to get the information um, to circulate to such a degree that we create feedback loops of understanding that uh, have have the fastest unlocks. So that is why and that's how i'm using dna in soil and compost dna sequencing in soil and compost we've gone almost an hour thank you all for hanging out for going deep with us and the thing is it's many people can you know what i mean you can get this microscope is extra expensive because of this but you can get a microscope like for four hundred dollars, two hundred to four hundred dollars, that allows you to do the prime eighty percent of the the the, the, the testing. Um, but there's so many other things too. There's so many points of distinction. So so it's not just microscopy. Though I'm writing a book on new protocols for microscopy as well right now. I'm, I'm forty five pages into that. Um, so if you want, <laughs> if you want more information and all that, stay tuned. I'm going to do more of these lives, uh, in the near future. And we're going to dig deep and continue to push this forward. And thank you for hanging out. I'm Matt Powers, grow abundantly, learn daily and live regeneratively. And I'll be talking more about soil science in the coming days. All right. Have a great one. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for hanging out.